Thank you, Saad, for that very nice introduction, and thank you for having me here. I definitely want to come back time after time because it's so beautiful here. I told my husband we have to figure out a way to move here. <laughs> he doesn't speak French, and neither do I. But. So I have the dubious task of being not only the last presenter of the meeting, although I know we have a workshop later, but also the thing that stands between you and lunch. So I'm going to try to make this dynamic, although I have to say I don't think my melatonin worked quite as well as Barbara's. She was really gung-ho and energetic up here. So I'm going to try to like bring on the extra dynamic speaking today um, to keep you all awake. So I'm going to tell you about an intervention trial that we did where we used a combination of customized fact sheets and motivational interviewing. And it was really great to have the other motivational interviewing um, talk by Arnaud earlier today. I think that really helped to set the stage about why this is important. And I have to say, I have trial envy that he gets to do this enormous randomized control trial. I feel like I've got like my 16 little practices and oh, yay me. <laughs> but um, hopefully you'll find the information useful. So just a few disclosures that I wanted to put out there. So I think most of you know this, but I know not everyone here is maybe is intimately familiar with the U.S. vaccination system as others. So I just want to point out that in the U.S. among adolescents, HPV vaccination is a huge problem. So this graph is demonstrating different birth cohorts starting in 2006 and the percent of 13 to 17 year olds vaccinated. And what you see at the top is that Tdap and the meningococcal ACWI vaccines have pretty high vaccination levels. but uh, initiation and completion of the HPV vaccine series for females and for males is much lower. So even though these vaccines have been available in the U.S. for roughly the same amount of time, the coverage level for HPV is much, much lower and a, a big problem for us. And we know from a lot of re research that provider recommendation is really a key factor that helps parents get motivated to vaccinate. So these are results from a survey done by a colleague of mine in 2013 that assessed the top five reasons why parents of girls on the left and parents of boys on the right didn't get their adolescent vaccinated against HPV. And what I think is striking is that, you know, in this year the study was done, which was seven years after the universal vaccine recommendation for girls and a couple years after the universal vaccine recommendation for boys, not being recommended by the child's provider was one of the top five reasons. And I think the thing that's really key to remember here is that this does not mean that the provider didn't make a recommendation. What it means is the parent that didn't perceive a vaccine recommendation was made. And that's really the crux of the talk and one of the issues that we're gonna try to tackle today. We know that providers often do a bad job in how they recommend the vaccine. So uh, Melissa Gilkey and her colleagues did a national study of primary care providers in 2014 and showed really just how bad the problem was. So she found almost two thirds of providers used a risk-based approach for deciding who to get and who to recommend the HPV vaccine to. Almost half of them recommended that the vaccine be given at a later visit. So they might bring up the vaccine at 11 to 12 years old, but say, oh, you know, you should get it next year or when you're 15. And a little over a quarter and almost 40% did not routinely recommend the vaccine for adolescent females and males respectively. So clearly, U.S. providers have a long way to go to doing a good job. So th this has felt like me over the last few days here. There's been delicious fruit outside and then there's been like gigantic pastries and I'm constantly being challenged with which, which road should I take. So um, I, what I just bring this picture up to point out is as we've talked about before, there's really a need for vaccine communication 2.0 vaccination decisions, especially for parents who perceive them as complicated because they have a lot of concerns, have emotional responses and reasons for deciding to get or not get vaccinated. And these decisions are not just based on logic, re reason, or facts. So we know from a lot of research done by others that there are a few preferred communication strategies with regard to HPV vaccination. One of them is the presumptive recommendation, which probably everybody here is familiar with. This is using language that assumes the parent is going to agree to vaccinate as opposed to using language, which makes it sound like vaccination might be more of an optional decision. Using something called the blanket recommendation. So I like to think of this as having all the vaccines that are recommended for th that child that day being put into one long gigantic word. So it'd be something like, you know, your daughter is due for meningitis, HPV, Tdap, and flu today. So just imagine that as like a 27 letter word. And then using language that conveys that your recommendation is strong. 
So that seems like, well, that's pretty easy to do, but actually there's very little data on how, what are the words you actually use to do that. So again, Melissa Gilkey's group has tried to operationalize this definition and some of the things that she has brought up as being something that would consist of a strong recommendation is recommending it for everybody in the age range for who the vaccine is recommended, having the recommendation be for getting the vaccine on the same day that it's being discussed and using language that's very unequivocal, somewhat like the presumptive approach that we talked about before. Well, this is great, and there is evidence to support those simplistic and somewhat effective communication strategies, but what happens when you use a blanket approach and a presumptive approach and the parent decides that they still don't want the vaccine? And that's where in our work we really try to train providers on using this sort of two-staged approach where they then pivot to use a, using motivational interviewing. So Arno already went through this about what motivational interviewing is, and I just want to point out one thing, which is really that the focus here is that the provider becomes a helper in the change process rather than trying to get to a specific healthcare goal. So motivational interviewing is based on four central tenets, empathy, collaboration, evocation, and support for autonomy. And I'm gonna go through a case example in a few slides that will hopefully demonstrate to you how you might use these various components. And in that case example, these are gonna be labeled in green. So the way that we tested this is in something called the PCOM trial, that stands for Provider Communication. And it was a cluster randomized trial that we did in Colorado among 16 primary care practices, including pediatrics and family medicine. And these included clinics that were funded by the government and took public insurance as well as private practices. And we had a four component intervention that we implemented. The first was HPV fact sheets that were developed by patients and providers and I'll talk a little bit more about that. We also had a, a written HPV vaccine decision aid, a web-based um, educational intervention that provided customized material to parents and then communication training. And although we, we actually designed this um, intervention along the process adoption precaution model, trying to meet parents at different stages in the vaccine decision making process, what we found from a lot of evaluation is that the fact sheet and the communication training seem to really be the core elements that drove this um, intervention success. So I'm gonna spend the rest of the time talking just about those. So our communication training was much like what we had talked about before. We trained providers on how to start the conversation using a blanket and presumptive approach. And if that didn't work, or if they felt like they were encountering some fairly significant vaccine hesitancy, then to pivot to using MI techniques. Now, I, I was so impressed with Arno's study where he talked about th their trainers coming in for multiple hours of training. And that's definitely not something that you can get a primary care provider to do very easily. So we tried to make our intervention um, something that could be potentially more generalizable. And we were able to do our motivational interviewing training in a, a much more compact way. And one of the reasons that this worked is we focused on six micro skills of motivational interviewing. So two strategies, one is the ruler. If you don't know what that is, I'll show you in a minute. And the other is elicit provide elicit, which is um, EPE. And then some of the skills that we taught providers, and some of these they knew already, but this was just to help them sort of make them more concrete in their mind, was using reflection, so stating back to the person what you heard. Um, that's also something that is involved in using summaries. Affirmation, so you know, agreeing with a person to, uh, to indicate to them that they have, that you have understood what they're saying. And then using open-ended questions to understand what the issues are. So these will also be demonstrated in the case example and they are in red. Um, so our trainings were specific to the HPV vaccine conversation. And what we found was that most pediatricians had not ever had MI training before, but most family medicine providers had. But even though the family medicine providers had had some training, most of the training that they had had was in a completely different health area. So usually it was either chronic disease management or um, substance abuse. And they really actually appreciated having the training be specific to the HPV vaccine conversation. So what we did is we created a 30 minute self um, directed webinar, which just went over the basics of MI. And then we had two 45 minute in-person sessions that happened over lunch. So there was food and chewing going on at the same time. In the first session, what we did is we brought in a professional motivational interviewing trainer 
who then worked with a member of the study, te te um, study team to demonstrate techniques. So I would be, for example, the patient and she would be the provider and we would have a, a fake conversation where she would respond in real time to my, my hesitation or concerns. And then in the second session, we did the same kind of thing, but now we had the providers themselves play the provider role and either she or I would play the role of the patient. And then the trainer would give real-time feedback to the providers so that they could sort of learn on using the actual techniques about how they did a good job or how maybe they needed to think about some other techniques. So we just had a paper come out that actually describes the um, motivational interviewing training in more detail. If you want to learn more about that, it's uh, detailed here. So I want to go through a case example trying to show you how we use some of the MI techniques and tenants. And this is exemplary of what we did sort of during our training, although it wasn't as scripted as this. It was much more um, just kind of what arose de novo in, in our conversations. But these were the kinds of conversations that we would have. So in this case example, you're seeing a 12-year-old boy who you haven't seen in a few years um, in for a well visit and to get some forms signed for school. And you finish the visit and you offer, as you've been, dis been taught, a presumptive blanket recommendation for all of the adolescent vaccines, HPV, Tdap, and the meningococcal vaccine. Uh-oh, wait a minute. The mom agrees to Tdap and the meningococcal vaccine, but she does not want to get HPV. This happens to me all the time in clinic, and that's how I feel, the sad little ball in the sea of happy balls. <laughs> so um, here we're going to demonstrate the ruler. So in this case study, you're a little surprised because you've known this family for a long time, and this child has actually received all of their recommended vaccines until now. So you're going to use the ruler to find out more, and you're going to say, oh, I see, well, on a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 never getting the vaccine and 10 definitely getting it today, where are you at? Now, if the mom says one, you're kind of done. You got to move on to a different technique. But luckily for us, in this case, she says, oh, I'm about a three. Now, this gives you a leverage point where you can focus on, well, what are the things that are making her a three instead of a one? What are those couple of positive things that she sees about the vaccine that maybe you can leverage to your advantage? So you're going to say, okay, well, can you tell me more about why you're a three instead of a one? So this is demonstrating elicitation and evocation. And then, of course, you can use some open-ended questions. The mom says, well, I, I definitely don't want my son to ever have cancer, so I'm open to the idea of the vaccine, but I'm just scared it's not safe. Okay, well, would you mind telling me what safety issues you're worried about? Far better to say that than to say, oh, did you hear about the girl walking backwards when she got the HPV vaccine? Have you guys seen that video? Todd has. He's laughing over there. So, I mean, and sometimes when you say that, they're like, no, I didn't even know about that. Oh, my gosh, there's another thing I've got to worry about I hadn't even thought about before. So that's why open-ended questions are important. So in this case, the mom says, well, I've heard that some children that get the vaccine can die from it, and I know it's probably not true, but it just makes me worry. So now you're going to use the techniques of affirmation and collaboration, or asking permission to share more. So you reflect back the concern to this mom to make sure that you understand and summarize what you heard, and then you're going to proceed with a, with a permission from her to make a recommendation. So in this example, it sounds like one of your biggest concerns is safety, but since you're okay with the other vaccines, this is an HPV vaccine-specific worry that you have. I can see why your concerns would scare you. That would scare me too. This question of dying from the vaccine has come up for me before from other patients, and I've looked into where it came from. Would you mind if I went over what I found out and why I think this is such an important vaccine? So this last thing about asking permission is really key here. What this does is it lowers the psychological barriers that people put up when they know they're about to be confronted with maybe some information that is not quite in alignment with their worldview. And it makes it easier for them to digest and maybe even accept the information that you're about to give them. It's such a simple thing to do, but it's really quite effective. So the mom says, okay. And then you go ahead and you give your, um, your response. You know, you go through and explain about how the rumors spread, but there's no, there's no basis to them. The vaccine's very well studied. It prevents cancer, works really well. You've given it to your own children. You think it's really important. And then you finish up with the final part of the MI, which is autonomy, where you say, you know, this is actually only a decision that you can make, though, so what do you think? So that's a, an example of how you can use MI in a conversation. It's pretty brief. You can see that didn't take a lot of time. It's something that could be feasibly done during a clinic visit, and I think by demonstrating these very specific examples to providers, they start to understand how little tweaks in their way of having the conversation can maybe make a big impact 
on what it is that they're trying to do. So I'm going to shift gears now and talk a little bit about the fact sheets, which was the other component of our intervention that was very well received. So the fact sheets were, were based on this idea of the targeting tailoring continuum. So as you increase the degree of audience segmentation, you also de increase the degree of customization of information. And for a long time, I had done some trials looking at individually tailored information and how that might actually impact vaccine hesitancy. And the short answer of about 10 years of work is that we didn't find an effect at all. So we decided to take another approach. And, um, you know, whereas most information about vaccines is general or mass audience targeted, we wanted to see if maybe we could find a sweet spot in the middle where we're looking for information that is targeted to a particular group but is not individually customized. So we helped practices create targeted customized fact sheets for the patients in their practice. And the process that we used is we first created a template. So it was a two page or one page template. It was kind of like a drag and drop type of thing where people could see how much room they had to put information in there. And we created a fact sheet library. It had a bunch of text, a bunch of pictures, a bunch of graphics, and uh, providers could look through and see what they liked. Then we met with the practice, again with lunch, sometimes breakfast, and we had them go through this library and pick out the ones that they liked the best. And this was everybody in the practice that was involved in immunization delivery. So it was the providers, it was the nurses, sometimes it was the medical assistants, sometimes it was the front desk staff, anybody who you know, could potentially interact with a patient and, and have a voice in this process. So we had them choose which things they thought were most relevant and most interesting. And in some cases, we had to really prioritize which pieces to put in the fact sheet based on their role in the practice. So obviously, if it's a provider or a nurse who is interacting with a patient all the time, we might take their choices over that of a front desk staff who has only minimal interaction with the patient. And then we created a draft fact sheet, sent it back to the practice and did a little bit of refinement and came up with finalized versions. So here's an example of one of the fact sheets. And uh, you can see the top half is about the virus. So the bottom half is about getting vaccinated. And there's not just only text, but some graphics and some um, infographics in there. And here's another fact sheet that a different practice put together. Same basic layout, but you can see that the look and feel is really different. So for example, some of the practices that might have had a very high Hispanic population often would pick out a statistic about cervical cancer being more common among Latinas than among other race or ethnic categories. So I really briefly want to go through the results. I presented this before and it's been published, but to get to the crux of the, the results, this is the, um, the main input from the trial. So just to orient you here, we have control and intervention practices. We have um, vaccination uptake at baseline, and then we compare another cross-sectional group at the end of the study period. Everybody went up over time, but the intervention groups went up more than the um, control groups did. So for HPV vaccine series initiation, adolescents who attended intervention clinics had 46% odds higher of having um, initiated the vaccine series and 56% um, odds higher of having completed the series. So our intervention was effective. We looked at a lot of other outcomes, though, because as a practicing pediatrician, I am very sensitive to um, trying to create interventions that are actually feasible to implement into practice. And so what we found was that, first of all, the PCOM intervention, and particularly the motivational interviewing and communication training, helped improve provider self-efficacy for addressing HPV vaccine hesitation. And also, equally important, it didn't increase the amount of time that providers reported spending talking about the vaccine with hesitant parents. That's something that we were really concerned about at the beginning. Um, as I mentioned, the communication training and the fact sheet was the most highly used and perceived as the most useful components of the intervention. And we actually did a series of, um, of measurements over the time of the 12-month trial and found that use of both was sustained at a high level throughout. So I wanted to just share a couple of quotes from providers about these two components just to sort of demonstrate the type of impact it had. So this is a, a quote of, from a provider about the motivational interviewing training. And this provider said, any time that you run up, up, up to a parent that's having difficulty understanding a decision you're trying to help them with, if you can back off a little bit and approach it in a different way that draws a little bit more on what they're thinking about, you have a better chance of aligning the interests of both parties. So I think it's a powerful technique. Another provider said, 
you know, that you could continue the conversation when you were delivered a stop sign by asking permission, well, can I tell you some of my thoughts or my ideas? Because I was delivering it in a manner that gave them the choice, they'd say, sure. So I think that, you know, demonstrates that these providers really got what the, the essence of the MI training was supposed to do. And then here's just one quote about the fact sheet. It's laid out more easily and it's visually stimulating. It's not just paragraph after paragraph. And it was especially helpful because we took part in designing it. We picked the which pictures, graphics, and information it went on it to tailor to our practice. So I think the implication of this is that, as we've seen from Arnaud's study and hopefully this work and a, a building body of work in this area, motivational interviewing seems to be one of the few interventions that specifically seems to address vaccine hesitancy and empower providers to do so. And I'm hoping that future research will continue to explore this approach more broadly. As far as the fact sheets, you know, these are a really low cost intervention that are pretty easy to create and something that would be highly amenable to creating in an automated way. And it seems like the process of involving providers in their um, generation helps to stimulate their interest and investment in using them. So in the future, we're hoping to test a pared down version of the PCOM intervention that includes just those two components. We have an interest in te testing different dissemination methods. Obviously, we can't go around every practice around the country and hold their hand and do the training, so we need to find a more efficient way. Um, the idea of using fact sheets for other vaccines, and then Saad and I are actually involved in a, um, preparing a grant that's going to be looking at just the presumptive part of the communication training versus the presumptive part plus the fact sheet and the motivational interviewing to see what the added benefit of those two components is. So just a couple of references for you. Uh, this is the trial here if you are interested in reading more about that. This is a um, paper that just came out which is the results of our quantitative analysis looking at all the different intervention components and what providers thought about them. I like to really dumb things down for myself and while there is no book of MI for dummies, I kind of wish there was. So the way I like to think about this if I'm really tired is I think, well, just create a conversation where you're asking questions that parents are likely to say yes to. And there's actually something that's been created by the Unity Consortium, which is a nonprofit whose mission is to increase adolescent vaccination. They have some videos that demonstrate different communication techniques, including motivational interviewing. And then finally, the um, American Academy of Pediatrics and the Academic Pediatric Association got together and created an app, which is a, like, kind of like a game. It's a choose your own adventure type of thing where you get to role play Dr. Maria. And um, it shows you through this cartoon mechanism how to do motivational interviewing techniques about the vaccine. So it's available on the Google Play Store as well as iTunes. So maybe you can take a look at those. So thank you very much. Thanks for sticking with me. And um, thanks for your attention.